Right then guys and welcome to the Motorcast channel where today we're going to be reviewing the 9th and 10th Formula E E-Prix around New York. The first ever international motor race around New York and it's fair to say it was a pretty good race weekend or race weekends technically. It was two races, one weekend but it was a good couple of races for Sam Bird winning both E-Prix and despite not even taking pole position, he only qualified ninth in the first um, in the first qualifying session, but still was able to win both E Prix. Really, Sam Bird on top of the world in New York, to be honest. So, Toby, we'll start off with you. Sam Bird, just he was just brilliant, wasn't he? Just completely peerless. Yeah, I should say near perfect weekend for him. I mean, as you said, he missed out on the uh, pole for race nine of the championship, but uh, two wins. And a pole. Of course, his teammate, uh, Alex Lynn, had his first race and did really well as well. But uh, I think Sam Bird is the best of the rest. I mean, you've got Boemi and Degrassi there. Um, and when they aren't at the title fight at the front, um, then kind of Bird prevails a little bit. You know, barring a little bit of re- reliability and bad luck. Um, he could have been in the title fight at the end of the day. But uh, a great thing to see, you know, him actually having a good time rather than breaking down or having a bad pit stop. Uh, it's just nice to see somebody who's, you know, a genuine guy. Obviously, I've interviewed him, you know, really nice chap. Um, and more importantly, a fantastic racer. Um, you know, somebody who's really quick. And uh, Formula E is lucky to have him, you know, as well as the drivers such as Buemi, Degrassi, Ver and Rosenqvist. Um, those sort of people. Uh, maybe not Nico Pross, but we'll move on to him later. Um, but yeah, Sam Bird, fantastic weekend. And uh, I guess he could just enjoy it while it lasts, because I don't think uh, it'll be quite so easy in uh, Montreal in two weeks' time. Well, yeah, you've already mentioned there about Sam Bird being a decent driver. He's currently fourth in the Drivers' Championship. I believe, mathematically, he could still win the Drivers' Championship. He's on 100 points, 57 behind Sebastian Buemi, which I believe means Sam Bird theoretically could win the Drivers' Championship. But of course... It's unlikely. Sam Bird this season, he's had a lot of bad luck and, you know, a few mistakes on his part. So, Joe, would you say that Sam Bird is certainly, you know, given the right car, would you say that he is the sort of driver who could win, you know, a championship in Formula E? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I I seem to say every, every single review that we do on here, I always seem to say... Uh, that you know, Sam Bird just needs to find that consistency uh, in order to to be in that be in that title fight, and you know he found that this weekend. Um, it was interesting, of, uh, of course, in race one, him qualifying in ninth. Uh, so you know he was that far down the grid, and he was also starting on the dirty side as well. So you know didn't didn't even have the benefit of being on the clean side of the grid for the start. So yeah, fantastic fantastic weekend from uh, from him, pretty much faultless. And yeah, if he, if he could um, if he could have found that in even just a couple more race race weekends, you know, especially in the middle of the season where where he uh, you know re- really really struggled, uh, you know, look at round five and round six, he took took the fastest lap in both races, um, but yeah, just got involved in incidents, and that that's that's been his problem all season, you know, if he if he can keep a clean race. Um, and you know, survive lap one, have no uh, no car issues. Then yeah, I think I think we would definitely have have seen him at least up with with uh, with Degrassi, and still in with a shout of uh, of getting the, the the well a realistic chance of of getting the championship as we go to Montreal. Well, there you go. That's top reviews for Sam Bird there, and Alex Lynn. Alex Lynn, his teammate, um, Sam Bird's teammate for this weekend, standing in for Jose Maria Lopez and Alex Lynn. Started off so well, took pole position in Super Pole for the first um for the first race here in New York, and it was a great start for Alex Lynn. But then he had um car failure issues in both of the races, missed out on scoring some decent points for Virgin and Alex Lynn. Toby, did he impress you? Was he you know did he exceed your expectations? What you, what could you say about him? Well, absolutely. It's great to see British talent as well in Formula E. Maybe it was only for this weekend, but. Adam Carroll's obviously British as well, but he hasn't really been able to get up there with his car this year. Uh, Something I'd like to point out is that Alex Lynn, from the start of the weekend, which most importantly was wet, um, and I was quite excited seeing that uh, that it was wet, but unfortunately it wasn't wet for the races. But uh, no, he had had really good handling in the car. He's, He's had loads of time in the simulator, but that's still... It is the closest thing to driving the car, but still it isn't driving the car. Uh, the thing that really impressed me at the end of the day, and the only place where he could have impressed because his car was shocking um, all weekend. I mean, he had a drive shaft failure in race one, 
uh, and another problem, I believe, in race two. I can't remember what it was, but certainly another problem in race two. But in qualifying, he got pole position. Now, that could have been luck or whatever. But unfortunately for Lynn, and unfortunately for, you know, Bird in the second race, it was a little bit stupid, we were discussing this before we came on, that the pole was on the... Uh, the out, was it on the outside of the grid? Yeah, it was. So basically, second place, whatever start they got, unless they got a shocking start, could just move up the inside and get first place quite easily. But Alex Lynn drove really well. Uh, he didn't make any mistakes, I don't think. But it was a really good first weekend for Lynn. It's nice to see more British talent in uh, the formula. Just a shame that his car. Well, it's just just a shame that he kind of got uh, the typical Sam Bird look uh, this weekend, if you like. Well, you say Sam Bird luck, but. Yeah, it was Sam Bird luck, but you could also argue, I mean, if you look at Sonny's qualifying position, considering he qualified first in Super Bowl for the first race, but then the second race qualified qualified all the way down in 17th, would you say, Joe, would you say there's a degree of beginner's luck? Does Alex Lynn really have the skill? I mean, brilliant in the first race, sure, unlucky with car reliability once the race actually started, but... Alex Lynn, you know, first to seventeenth. That's not really great consistency, but you know, still, would you would you say that overall he deserves to get a drive? At, you know, maybe in Formula E, maybe in another series. Yeah, I'd I'd love to see that. I mean, I, I wouldn't personally say it was down to sort of like the the beginner's luck or whatever. I just think he was he was genuinely uh, on the pace, and uh, we've seen so many times uh, in in Formula E ever, ever since it started that it, it you know it's so difficult to hook up that that good qualifying lap. Um, you know, this weekend, prime example, not just for Alex Lynn, but for Lucas Degrassi. You know, he just he, he couldn't get the car up to the up to the front of the grid. Uh, you make one small mistake, uh, uh, you know, anywhere in, on the circuit, and and you get punished for it. And I think that's the the beauty of Formula E. Sometimes is that um, you know we go to these very tight street circuits, and they're very technical, and it it really rewards the driver who. Um, who who can just you know hook up that that good lap and Alex Lynn managed to do it twice, uh you know he managed to do it in in the initial qualifying then managed to do it in Super Bowl as well so, uh yeah impressed with him really really disappointed that he had that he had the car issues because I think especially in race one, um he he definitely had the the pace to score some some good points but you know obviously he did bring some uh, some points home for the the DS Virgin team and uh, yeah hopefully that will help them when we get to the end of the season. Yeah, nicely summarised there. So, so DS Virgin, they were certainly the team everybody's talking about, as we've just talked about, come the end of the of the New York E Prix or E Prix. But certainly, everybody's eyes heading into the weekend were on Lucas Degrassi, because heading into this weekend, Lucas Degrassi, the only real championship contender to um or realistic championship contender to Sebastian Buemi, and with Sebastian Buemi um competing in WEC this weekend, missing out on two E Prix, really all eyes were on Degrassi to see if he could catch up to Sebastian Buemi in the championship. He's now only um only ten points behind, yes, only ten points behind in the championship to Sebastian Buemi. But in the races, he finished fourth and fifth to Lucas Degrassi. Not that brilliant in qualifying. Made up places in the races, certainly. But, Toby, would you say that this was a missed opportunity for Degrassi, considering I'm sure many people would consider Degrassi to be the best driver in Formula E, aside from Buemi. But to only finish fourth and fifth, poor qualifying, that really was a missed opportunity for him, don't you think? I think the pressure was definitely on because obviously you know he had to gain on Buemi and got and he's got within ten points. So I guess you could say it was a successful weekend. But like you say, he did have a scrappy weekend. He had a crash in practice, which didn't really help him along his way. But with Sam Bird performing so well this weekend and a number of drivers performing well, I think it was tricky to keep up with them. And it's a little bit like you see in most title fights. You don't necessarily see the driver in second winning every race before you get to the end. Um, you kind of see them in the midfield, and it's whoever can beat uh, one another. And obviously, with Buemi not being here, Degrassi automatically beat him this weekend. But like you say, not great for Degrassi this weekend. I think it was just the pressure was on. And we, as you know, with Formula E, it's quite variable because, you know, you, apart from Buemi winning the first few races on the trot, it, it's been a quite tricky season for all drivers. Because at the end of the day, it's a really good calibre in Formula E. So it's not like it's a trot to the finish for Degrassi enough in his first every race. But it's not over yet. I think that's pretty important to remember. You know, there's two races in Montreal, two Ypres in Montreal. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And there's, what, over 50 points up for grabs? So you simply never know what will happen. It might be 
uh, sealed for Bohemi in the first race, or it might well be that Degrassi's in front of Bohemi after the first race in Montreal. But uh, a scrappy weekend for Degrassi, but, you know, at least he scored some points to make the title fight interesting. Yes, yeah, certainly interesting, I think is a good way to describe the championship hunt. Only 10 points still, relatively close with two E-Pre in Montreal coming up. But Joe, do you, do you still reckon that Degrassi could... Well, I mean, I'm basically asking for your championship prediction, prediction really, between um, between Degrassi and Buemi. Um, yeah, do you really think Degrassi can... Well, yeah, your championship prediction, what do you reckon is going to happen? I think it's definitely all to play for. Um, you know, we've seen over the course of the season, it's it's pretty much all or nothing with uh, with Buemi. You know, he's he's managed to take um, was it six victories in the, in the eight rounds that he's participated in, but uh, in the other two races, he he didn't finish uh, with with uh, with any points. He managed to get a fastest lap point um, in one of the races, but yeah, apart from that, it's uh, it's been very much uh, all or nothing. So yeah, even if we see that in in one of the two races in uh, in Montreal, then then Degrassi's got a chance, but. But yeah, as we've seen this weekend, and uh, as we've seen in in you know previous rounds this season, he he hasn't necessarily been the best of the rest. And and in you know if the likes of Sam Bird and Felix Rosenqvist, um, and even Nico Prost, you know if if any of those or or maybe other drivers can can have a good weekend, a solid weekend, and manage to out qualify the Grassi in one of the races. It's going to make it very difficult, and I think we all expect Buemi to be right back on the pace again uh, when when we when we uh, make it to Montreal. So, yeah, a little bit of a missed opportunity this weekend for Degrassi. Um, doesn't I wouldn't say he takes the momentum into the final round. Yes, he's gained twenty two points, but it, it could have been a hell of a lot more. And yeah, I, th- I think Buemi is going to be on the pace and, uh, and really want to take that title. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's Degrassi. So. I didn't really hear a championship prediction there, to be honest, but we'll come back to I'll that. I'll go Buemi. I'll go Buemi. You'll go for Buemi. Well, to be fair, I will, yeah. I will come back to that at the end of at the end of this as well, because I'll ask Toby for his prediction as well. But, um, yes, we'll move on to Daniel Apt, who really just was just really unlucky. Good in qualifying in the first race, qualified second, but as we've already discussed, thanks to the starting grid and qualifying second meant that you had the inside line. Apt took the lead, um, heading into the start or going out of the first corner of the first race but then he had car issues in both races I believe and it was just it's just bad luck really for Daniel App to be honest um, I'll chuck this out to either of you two if any of you two want to add anything to da- or to the Daniel App situation because really the pace was there but certainly the car reliability wasn't you just want to, uh, you just want to uh, give him a hug, I think, because he had a really good qualifying in race one, and in race two got the fastest lap. Um, so he's got the pace, but the car just hasn't performed. And it seems that one drive from every team, whether that be Sam Bird for Virgin or Daniel App for Audi, it seems that one driver always gets the real bad luck, and it's been Daniel App this season, and it's just a real shame. And uh, I guess it, well, it is just a shame for him and. Uh, Gutty look after, I think, re- not necessarily the second E-Pre, but the first E-Pre, he could have not easily won it, but he could have won that E-Pre. So you're going to be gutted, aren't you? You know, in whatever racing series, if you could have won the race and then your car stops, you're going to be gutted. But uh, I-, I just feel sorry for him because he's a good driver and uh, I think that definitely knocks his confidence a lot, that does. Yeah, I pretty much echo that, to be honest. Um, to come away from, uh, you know, a weekend where he's... he's... Pretty much, yeah, I'd say apart from Sam Bird, he's definitely up there with with one of the drivers who was really on it uh, this weekend. And to have come away with with one point from the two races is is must be pretty demoralising. So yeah, hopefully he can pick himself up and uh, you know score some good points again in Montreal. Um, obviously, we don't know uh, much about the Montreal circuit and you know which drivers it's going to suit. But uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll be uh, he'll be determined to make up for for lost points uh, in New York. Okay, so on to Tachita, and Tachita, the New York e Prix, it really was a tale of two halves for Tachita. The first race ended up going quite well for Tachita, thanks to uh, thanks to incidents and luck involving Alex Lynn and Nick Heifeld. Tachita, they were able to capitalise, took their first double podium, and then the second race, it was it just it all just fell apart for Tachita, arguably due due to strategical decisions with coming into the pits later than everyone else under a full course yellow really just not a particularly great race for Tachita 
So, uh, so Toby, how would you summarise the Cheetahs' weekend? Was it? I mean, you know, because it was a missed opportunity in the second race, but the first race they got lucky. So, you know, what could you really say there? Um, well, uh, lucky in the first race, maybe a little bit. I guess they did capitalise on the likes of Lynn and Heidfeld going out. But even if those hadn't have done, they'd have got at least fourth and fifth. So it was very strong um, for both drivers, and particularly Sarazan, who's only been at the team for a few e pre. But I guess race two was the one that they really buggered it up, didn't they? Obviously, they pitted after the full course yellow, which massively let them down. But it was a good comeback to P8 uh, to Verne after the appalling strategy. But I guess in race one, it was you know it was a good race for both, and they're both good drivers at the end of the day. As I said, as I've said and echoed in all of these uh, reviews, they're all good drivers on the grid, maybe apart from Martin Guar in the first few races. But uh, you know they're all good drivers, and to finish well is is a really tough task. But I think both are on the pace this weekend, and uh, great to see a team who obviously are powered by Renault, and you know th- 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 they were Team Aguri, weren't they uh, before this season? So they weren't as good, but this season they've got Renault powertrains and. Uh, they seem to be up there, which is really nice to see. And for Johnny Verner, obviously, uh, should still be in Formula 1. But um, because he was as good as Daniel Ricciardo, we did have this discussion early on in the season. But uh, Sarazan's a good driver as well. So nice to see both drivers doing well. And uh, a good weekend, apart from an appalling strategy on race 2. And I think the per- person who uh, decided to call for that strategy ought to be either reprimanded or, or, um, or sacked. But there you go. Yeah, and to Cheetah, I was I was surprised to find this out earlier on. Actually, that to Cheetah, they're only fifth in the team's championship, which I guess is quite good. You've already alluded to it, Toby. Where considering that to Cheetah is just um, or formerly the Team Aguri team, so they they've improved compared to last season. But really, considering they've got um, considering it is a car very closely linked to the Renault Edams car, um, I think a customer powertrain. Really, to be fifth in the team's championship. As far as I'm concerned, I think that is a slight disappointment. Um, and I think, I think again, this race, um, going back to you, Joe, I think this race really does uh, just highlight to Cheetah that I you really don't know what to make of him, to be honest. Great at some points, really bad at others. And um, yeah, just um, yeah, if there's anything else you really want to say about to Cheetah. Yeah, they're, they're sort of on their own. They're very much in no man's land in the uh, in the team's championship. You know, they've had they've had had a a couple of uh, of good rounds, you know, early on in the season, round three and round four, they scored big points there or, or decent points there, and then again the first race in New York, you know, that was their was by far their their best race of the season. But uh, no, I, I think they can class this season as a reasonable success. Um, obviously, their first first season um, in the sport after they, um, as you say, acquired Team Agori. Um, I'd imagine there's quite a lot of new staff there, uh, you know, who are uh, maybe not not quite as experienced as as the likes of Renault, um, Audi, um, and you know, they're, they're they're big teams. You know, they've they've got a lot of people behind them. So, uh, yeah, I think Cheetah can can take encouragement from it, and you know, <laughs> um, strategy calls like they had in race two, although they're not going to help. That's not going to help them uh, points wise. I think that will be very much a learning curve for them, and uh, yeah, hopefully they can. Uh, learn from that and uh, not not quite mess up the strategy the same in the future again. Well, Renault Edams, Renault Edams, the team's championship leader, the team which Sebastian Buemi drives for when he's not uh, driving for Toyota and the WEC, really was, again, much like Tichita, considering they are a similar team in terms of the equipment used. Renault Edams, such a strange weekend. I mean, Pierre Gasly replacing, um, replacing Sebastian Buemi, big news, but then... 19th in qualifying for the first race for Pierre Gasly was strange, to be honest. And, you know, I mean, my heart sank when I heard that, that he was going to replace Sebastian Bremi and start at the exact other end of the grid. Still finished 7th, still beat Nico Prost. And even at the second race, um, which Pierre Gasly finished 4th, having a much better qualifying, he still beat uh, Nico Prost there. So really, Nico Prost, considering he's been in Formula E, he's been in that team from day one, and Pierre Gasly, despite having a dreadful qualifying uh, for the first race, still outscored Nico Prost. Um, Toby, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain I know what you're going to say, because I don't think you've said too many favourable things about Nico Prost in the past, but really, uh, you know, I mean, how much of a shame is that for Nico Prost to be outscored by Pierre Gasly in his Formula E debut? Well, put it this way, the only highlight I can remember Prost having Formula E is the first race when he crashed into Heidfeld at the last corner. But 
Uh, apart from that, he's not really had any highlights, and I'm going to keep this clear and concise. As you, as you said, Prost got 12 points this weekend. Gasly got 18 points. It's clear, you know, Gasly's a good driver, but he qualified 19th in the first qualifying. So whether that's luck or not, he's clearly getting used to the car. Uh, and there's only one reason that Prost is there, and that's because of his father. But uh, it, uh, I guess it's good for Edams to have somebody like um, Prost there because he's picking up points. But obviously, you know, he's not too much of a threat to Buemi, but, well, he shouldn't be there, in my opinion. But, um, you know, I'm sure we'll I'm sure we'll hear what Joe thinks in a second, whether he'll be as harsh as me, I doubt it. But uh, a good first weekend for Gasly, you know, it's good to point out that it's positive for him. Um, hopefully in F1 next season, maybe replacing uh, Daniel Kvyat, uh, or maybe Carlos Sainz to Hungary. But, um, well, we might uh, talk about that a little bit later in the F1 podcast. But uh, a good first weekend for Gasly, which is all positive and good and uh, it was a bit cute, peculiar actually after the uh, second race there was an incident on the last corner in a Heidfeld uh, we did watch that before we started here and I don't quite get what happened there whether Heidfeld hit him or not but still P4 and that's a solid result for any uh, any driver in their second E-pre yeah certainly a decent result I mean Pierre Gasly to crash as you mentioned I kind of forgot about that to be honest that Pierre Gasly crashed across the finishing line and still finished in fourth and still beat Nico Prost I mean, Nico Prost, he certainly has been in the shadow of Sebastian Buemi. Here he's been in the shadow of Pierre Gasly. And it's not like Nico Prost is a dreadful driver by any means, but he certainly has been outperformed by, well, both of his teammates now. So, Joe, do you reckon, I mean, Nico Prost, we know he's he's a driver for the team largely because of Alain Prost's commitment to, uh, to Renault Edams. But do you reckon, moving that aside, um, if Nico Prost didn't have the Prost name, do you reckon he would still be there or even deserves to still be with Renault Edams? Uh, I highly doubt it, if I'm being honest. Um, I think, yeah, th- I think it sort of needed a weekend like this where, you know, another driver comes in to, to really highlight that because we all know that Buemi is you know, arguably the, the well, not, not even arguably, I think he just is the best driver on the Formula E grid. Uh, in terms of uh, you know race management, uh, battery management, and and just uh, he's just got his sort of the full package really. But we, we, we you're never really too sure in, in in any form of motorsport how much of that comes down to the car uh, itself. And I, I I I'd say that the Renault is is you know definitely the the, the best car on the grid. Uh, so yeah, I think it was sort of highlighted by the fact that Gasly came in. And uh, and outperformed Prost that 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 was certainly the case and that that Prost has been un- underperforming for quite some time now. So uh, yeah, uh, obviously Gasly this season is um, competed in the Super Formula Championship over in Japan, and th- I believe that finishes at the end of October, and the new Formula E season starts at the start of December. So it does allow him to compete, I- or at least at the start of the Formula E season, if he hasn't been confirmed at. Um, at Toro Rosso for next season so I I'd love to see the seat at least open for him to take um if he chooses to but uh yeah I'd I'd love to see him in F1 F1 next season and uh yeah it was good to see him uh see him really compete against some big names this weekend yeah well Renault Edam she said that they are arguably the best team where they're 65 points ahead in the team's championship so you know it looks like I mean it's of course mathematically uh App Sport, um, Audi App Sport could still beat Renault Edams, but it looks like that the team's championship is pretty much nailed on for Renault Edams with just two E-Pre left to go. Anyway, on to the Mahindra team. And once again, this really was a race of two halves for Mahindra. Certainly, the, the pace was there. They certainly they certainly put on a show, certainly. Um, Rosenqvist was doing very well in the first race, but then... Just bottled it come the end, really. Spinning out um, when he was coming under pressure from Lucas Degrassi. And as always with Formula E, if you need to come in to repair your car, like Rosenqvist did, needed a rear wing change, um, then your race is over, essentially. All you can do is compete for fastest lap at that point. But then the second race is much better for um, for Mahindra to take a double podium just about ahead of Pierre Gasly. So, Mahindra... Um, yeah, really, Toby, what can you say, really? I mean, Rosenqvist, Rosenqvist, people keep saying that he is, you know, certainly a good enough driver, sort of like Sam Bird, you know, given the right car, could be a championship contender. But, um, well, I mean, do you really see that after his 
mixed performances this weekend? I mean, he spun under pressure from Degrassi, um, but I, I, I do rate Rosenqvist because from the start of this Formula E season, he's impressed. I mean, I think it was the second race where he finished second or third, and that really shocked me, you know, as a rookie. Um, and okay, you know, he spun under pressure, but there's lots of other drivers I can think in other series and in Formula E that, you know, have um, made mistakes under pressure. But, you know, at the end of the day, Mahindra got a double podium in race two, so I think that kind of made up for it. Um, and definitely good solid points this weekend for a team that I quite like. I mean, it's it's, it's got one of the best driver lineups on the grid, two really good drivers, and I think Nick Heidfeld is getting on a bit in terms of age. But he does push uh, Rosenqvist on a little bit. And just nice to see a little bit of a mix of youth and experience, not age, experience um, at the team. But uh, a fantastic, not necessarily a fantastic weekend, but uh, a good weekend, a solid weekend. I think that's the best word to describe it. A solid weekend for Mahindra. Yep, well, certainly a solid weekend. One of the highest scoring points teams over the course of the two New York E Prix, the highest scoring team in the in the second New York E Prix, the tenth race in the Formula E season. Mahindra third in the team's championship. They're only twelve points behind App Schaeffler Audi Sport, and they're a good thirty nine points ahead of DS Virgin. So Mahindra third in the team's championship, really, really doing well to be honest, considering they're they're such a mixed bag team. I mean, they're always they're either right up there or they're just they're just right the way down the field to be honest. So Joe. Uh, third in the team's championship, Mahindra. I mean, do you think? I mean, yeah. I mean, to be fair, they've exceeded my expectations. But um, what about you? I mean, yeah. I mean, they, how much higher up do you reckon they could be if they avoided sort of uh, reliability issues and mistakes like we saw in the um, in the first New York E Prix? Yeah, it's been um, it's been a good season for Mahindra. Obviously, they've been they tended to be sort of towards the back of the grid um, in the uh, in the first two seasons. But yeah, they've really really sort of sorted their act out this season. Um, especially the, that that middle part of the season, they had a they had a real purple patch, and it sort of continued on um, to the um, to New York. You know, could have been a could have been a lot better in race one, but. Um, you know, you could say the same for uh, for the App team as well. You know, Daniel App. Uh, had his fair share of problems so yeah the, all of these things will uh, you know they tend to even out as the season goes on so the yeah they're, they're only 12 points behind um Audi as we go into uh into Montreal but yeah if you could say by the same token that if if Daniel Apt had have had a a weekend that he deserved pretty much then uh then yeah they would have been out of sight so it's going to be difficult but they're very much in with a chance of uh, of grabbing that second place uh in, in Montreal Okay, so moving on to the Andretti team, and really just such a such a anonymous weekend for them. Uh, uh, Robin Fryne scoring four points in total this weekend, finishing ninth in both races, arguably getting a bit lucky, staying out of trouble while other people retired for various different reasons. And Antonio Felix da Costa, I was just checking while you were talking there, Joe, and Antonio Felix da Costa, I had to check. He didn't score any points, but um, really was... A quiet weekend for Andretti. I can't really think of any any standout moments for them. I mean, they scored four points, which is not massively great, to be honest. So, Joe, how would you summarise Andretti's weekend? Uh, yeah, as I think you pretty much summed it up. Pretty, uh, pretty anonymous, to be honest. Um, <laughs> they, they, they were sort of one of those teams where you... You, you didn't really notice that they were they were they were competing, um, and I think it says a lot that you had to look up, um, you know, whether uh, whether whether De Costa actually scored any points. But um, yeah, it's it's been a difficult season for them. Obviously, they they tend to have mixed fortunes, um, just just generally, you know, over the over the few seasons that they they've been in been in the sport. But uh, yeah, not not much you can really say. Not that much of an exciting weekend, but. Uh, you know, Robin Frines did did manage to score some uh, some points, um, and you know it begs the question as to to whether Frines should maybe make a move next season uh, to a better team. He, he he definitely showed his worth. Um, I believe in his second outing um, in Formula E, he managed to score a podium last season. So it shows you that you know if if he gets given a car that that is set up well for for a circuit, then it's you know. He he can definitely capitalise on that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what he ends up doing uh, next season. So, Toby, uh, coming back to you, how would you rate Andretti's weekend overall? 
Um, well, the car's not that good, is it? So they're going to struggle. Um, like Joe said there, you know, uh, Frights did get a podium in his second ever race. And Frights is a good driver. And hence why, you know, I think we both think that Frights should be a better team. Um, I don't know about De Costa, because De Costa is a good driver. I think he just gets bad luck. Um, and it was a poor weekend for him, but it is going to be a struggle for that team to get points. But four points of Frights gained after retirement, and I guess just picking up a few points to drop, uh, drag them sort of up the constructors table a little bit and uh, beat the likes of Jaguar and Venturi. Whether they do that or not, we'll have to see to wait to uh, Montreal. But I think that the Andretti, I don't know I don't know now because I remember saying a few ty- a few uh, podcasts ago that I think the Venturi was the worst car on the grid. Now I'd say it was the Jag uh, followed by the Andretti because the Jaguar just does seem to have some good races but... It seems that on general pace, they're probably at the bottom, but I would say that the Venturi is better than the Andretti because, well, it, it just seems like a better car, and, and I think they've got more points. So, uh, I think I can't remember, but they might do, they might not. But I would say probably on pace that Venturi is better than Andretti, so I guess they are going to struggle to get points. So four points is certainly a decent achievement this weekend. Well, it certainly is a decent achievement this weekend when you compare them to the amount of points that Jaguar scored this weekend. One point, courtesy of Adam Carroll, um, Jaguar they're still bottom in the in the team's championship. Mitch Evans retired from both races. Adam Carroll finished eleventh and tw- uh, no, sorry, tenth and eleventh. And really was just, I mean, much like with most races this season, Jaguar they came in to Formula E full of promise, uh, the first works Formula E team. Um, but really, even now, even towards the end of their first season, they still are languishing down at the bottom. They still. They're still just the slowest team, and well, they're still bottom of the team's championship. Haven't really shown any pace, and uh, and uh, and Toby, um, Jaggy were really. I mean, would you have expected them to have done a bit better by the end of the season? I think this season was just purely a testing season for them. You know, get some mileage in, get as many points as possible. They've got a good driver lineup. Uh, I don't think that will change. Maybe Carroll might go, but I don't think that will change. Um, I think both drivers are relatively happy because, you know, they haven't got the best car, but they have got that collaboration with Williams, which surely is going to be a, a solid one. And uh, maybe not a good season next year, but fingers crossed it does pay off next season to be a good season next year because it is a little bit embarrassing if it isn't. But I guess it's just, you know, holding out, maybe get some points and fingers crossed lift the south off the bottom of the constructors. But it is a shame, but uh, it is nice to have uh, a British manufacturing. So, uh, you know, that's all good, but... A poor season, but hopefully, fingers crossed, next season is a lot better. Hopefully, it's a lot better, yes. Um, just looking at the team's championship, it's quite tight at the bottom of the team's championship. Jaguar, obviously, last there on 21 points. Venturi are on 28, and both uh, Dragon and Andretti are only on 30 points. So, if Jaguar, if they had an abnormally decent race weekend, theoretically, they could move up, or move up, potentially to seventh in the team's championship it's unlikely but still um but yeah joe do you reckon i mean this season well it hasn't really gone well for jaguar whichever way you look at it but next season would you expect jaguar to be further up the field and how much further yeah it's it's always difficult to gauge you know teams like mahindra have um, all of a sudden emerged at the at the top at the sharp end of the field this season after uh, after finishing fifth last season and uh, eighth in season one. So it's it's always going to be difficult. I mean, I think it's a pretty safe assumption that they're probably not going to be up there, you know, fighting for championships next season. But um, what's to say that they can't be competed for for good points? Uh, you know, race in, race out. They 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 had a couple of good weekends this season. And um, yeah, as Toby said, I think this season was was you know, very much m- maybe not quite testing for them, but um, you know, definitely getting mileage on the car and and very much learning about the sport. You know, with them with them being a works team. So yeah, I think they've they've done a lot of learning this season, and uh, I think they will definitely be better next season. I I, I would bet that they won't be bottom at least. <laughs> you know, I think they'll be in the midfield. Well, let's hope so. Anyway, it'd be nice to see, it'd be nice to see Jaguar as a, as a works team, really. You know, just finish slightly higher up in the team's championship at least. But anyway, on to Dragon and Loic Duval took fifth in the um, at the end of the first E Prix in New York. But really, I mean, the second race wasn't. Um, 
it was eventful, certainly. I can't quite remember about the first race, but certainly the second race, it, it got very tight between D'Ambrosio and Duval, nearly taking each other out, which is something which we've seen on quite a few occasions, actually, that the Dragon drivers, they're certainly not afraid to race each other quite aggressively. But, um, yeah, I mean, Dragon, how would you rate their race? Uh, how would you rate their race weekend, Toby? I mean, yes, yeah, decent at the start, but, you know, the second race was, uh, well, one to forget for them. Yeah, I don't really think there's much to comment on. I doubt, I doubt you'll have to ask Joe the same question because there isn't really much to comment on. Um, obviously, Duval got a really solid P5, which was good. He did capitalise a little bit like um, Tachita did in the first race in those retirements. But as you say, they are quite, you know, willing to race with each other, and that's probably compromised them because I do think that Duval was in ninth, and after basically being hit by his teammate, he, I think that actually did collide. Um, Duval did finish 13th then, so... It has been a poor season for Dragon. It's kind of, you've got those bottom four teams, haven't you? Dragon, Jaguar, Andretti and Venturi. Uh, maybe propped up a little bit by Nextev, because Nextev don't seem that strong this season. But I think it's really, as, I, as I've said earlier, I, I can't really comment much, because, you know, these two drivers are good as well. Um, but it has been a poor season for the team. Um, and fingers crossed, maybe they might have a driver ch- change over the, um, you know, the, the season end. And it is um, Jay Penske, who does manage the team, and he's obviously, he's obviously had uh, lots of success in America. Um, so hopefully it will it'll come good for Dragon, because we do want to see a competitive grid throughout, but uh, it has been a poor season, definitely, and uh, definitely wants to forget. Maybe apart from that P5, though, in the first race, which was quite impressive, actually, so that was good. Yeah, certainly quite good for them. But, um, yeah, we'll move on to next EV then, because I think we really are getting to the teams where really there's not a great deal you can comment on. So next EV... Uh, we've written down here a confusing team with inconsistent pace, which I think sums up Next EV really well. They just, not even just this season, but over the course of all three Formula E seasons, there there's no real degree of consistency. Sometimes they're right up there fighting for race wins. Uh, this E Prix, this E Prix, uh, Oliver Turvey finished sixth in the first race. Uh, Nelson Piquet just missing out on points, but then both drivers missed out on points in the second New York E Prix. So. So, Joe, um, next EV, yeah. Nelson Piquet certainly lost out on points. Uh, Oliver Turvey didn't do too... Well, he, he did okay, I suppose. But, um, yeah, next EV, really, what can you say about them? I mean, just, yeah, confusing team, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the the, the season started off so well for them, uh, grabbing pole in the in the first round with Nelson Piquet, but ever since then, it's it's just been very confusing. Uh, Piquet has had a number of anonymous weekends this season, and, you know, to think that he took the title in, in season one as well. Um, it's been been pretty confusing, uh, to say the least. In, in the last few rounds, you know, um, Turvey has, has comprehensively outperformed uh, Piquet, and uh, yeah, he's looking like the, the the better driver of the two on on recent form. You know, scored some decent points. Did Oliver Turvey in in race one, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a difficult one because <laughs> you just you just don't know with Next EV to be honest. It's uh, you you summed it up very well at the start. Very very confusing team. So I I'd love to to comment uh, on on what I think they're going to do in uh, in Montreal, but. We just don't know, and I guess that's the beauty of Formula E. Okay, and finally, on to the Venturi team. And Mauro Engel, he retired from both races. Um, did get He did get the fastest lap, so they got bragging rights there. So Venturi, I guess you could argue to a degree that they've got the raw pace to get the fastest lap, certainly. Um, Tom Dillman, he picked up six points in the second race. But really, just Venturi, just... Again, one of those teams which really, I don't think they did anything stand out this this race weekend. And yeah, I mean, I'll throw it out to either of you two if you two want to add anything on to, yeah, to Venturi this weekend. I guess it's just that uh, Engel's got really good pace. It's a pity that he's only in that car because he has had quite a lot of good qualifying performances this year. Uh, I do remember back to Monaco and somewhere else, I think, I think he got pole somewhere, um, which was a real surprise. But as you say, fastest lap. So they have clearly got the raw pace. Um, and Dillman, it's nice to see him after not being in the car for long. Obviously, a permanent replacement now for Stefan Sarazan, who's, who's moved to, to Cheetah. But a good six points, a very good solid uh, six points in race two. Unbelievably, didn't beat the next, uh, the best driver on the grid, Nico Pross. But um, six points in race two and uh, ahead of Jaguar in the standings. So I guess that's a little bit of bragging rights there. And a little bit of bragging rights as well, of course, 
with Engel getting fastest laps. So not a shabby weekend, just a decent weekend, I suppose, for them. Joe, you got anything else to add to the Venturi front? No, I don't think so. I think Toby's pretty much uh, pretty much covered it. Um, not been a great season for them uh, on the whole, but uh, you know, scoring some some solid points this weekend. So, uh, f- especially for a team like them, that's um, that, that's you know, pretty good to, to to move them up. But uh, yeah, Engel, pretty pretty decent weekend, and just like Robin Freintz, it'll be uh, interesting to see whether he moves somewhere else next season. Certainly will be. But before we head into the next season, we've got the final two e in this Formula 1 season. Another double header in Montreal, the first ever e in Montreal. Brand new circuit, really, as you've already, I think you've said it many times this podcast, Joe, that uh, we really don't know what to expect in Formula E. It's the beauty of Formula E that it's so unpredictable. So I've, I've already asked you, Joe. So Toby, we'll, we'll go back to you. Um... Your predictions for the Montreal e Prix, but specifically in the Drivers' Championship. Is it going to be Degrassi? Is it going to be Buemi? Degrassi's 10 points behind, but, you know, with Sebastian Buemi coming back into the car, do you reckon he'll be able to defend his title? Or is Degrassi just going to overtake and pit Buemi in the final two e Prix? I think in reality, Degrassi had his chance this weekend, didn't he? And he hasn't been able to com- uh, capitalise on that. So it would be a pretty poor showing if um, Buemi kind of. I guess if Buemi does win, it's a little bit of a poor showing because he's obviously missed two races and he got disqualified from that Berlin E Prix. And I think that Degrassi's only had the one DNF. So if you put that over the twelve races, then it's sort of you know maybe thirty points that Buemi uh, Buemi could have got more. So definitely it should be Buemi. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go for Buemi um, because. Provided he has a good qualifying in both E-Pre for Montreal, it looks like looking at the track map, there's quite a few straights, so there shouldn't be much to worry about in terms of collisions um, and f- plenty of sort of 90 degree corners. So, no, nothing sort of like the hairpins that we've had in, um, in I was going to say in Montreal, no, in New York, sorry. Um, but I'm going to go with Boemi for the championship. And in terms of the races, I don't think, going to be quite quite a bold statement, I don't think Boemi and Degrassi will win either race. Um, I don't know who will. Maybe Sam Bird, maybe Rosenfist. Um, but I'm going to go with... I'm just pick, uh, plucking names out of the air here. I'm going to go for Jonic Vern to win the first e Prix, And for the second one, I'm going to go for... I'm going to go for Felix Rosenfist. Why not? So you said you said you don't reckon Degrassi or Burmy will win each race. Do you reckon we could see, like we saw the last season, a crash between those two? Um, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? I don't, it didn't really mean much, did it, last time? Um, we did think that, oh, maybe Buemi's retired. Um, it didn't mean much last time, but definitely it could be on the cars. There's a lot of uh, collisions in Formula E. Obviously not as fatal. Uh, not fatal, sorry, but uh, not as uh, damaging as uh, some of the F1 collisions we obviously have. That means that they have to make an extra pit stop. But um, it'd certainly be interesting, but I think both drivers will be looking for a clean end to the championship because... Um, I'm sure everybody will be talking about for weeks to come if uh, Degrassi cheated his way to the championship or anything like that. But I'm sure any headlines that come out of the Montreal e Prix we can talk about in a fortnight's time. Oh, certainly so. So, Joe, you've already said Buemi. You, you, it, well, I'll ask you again. Is your money still on Buemi to win the Drivers' Championship? Yeah, I think Buemi will definitely win the Drivers' Championship. Um, I just... Yeah, I can, I can just see him having that one, one really dominant race. I mean, I could, I could be wrong, but I just, I, I can just see him doing that. You know, he's, he just seems to have an, a, a knack of, you know, doing it at, at, at the right time. Um, in terms of the, uh, the grow, uh, the, the E Prix itself, um, quite a different track to, to what we saw in New York. It looks as if, uh, especially the end of the lap could be, could be quite flowing. Um. But yeah, it's, it's anyone's guess as to who's who's going to win. Uh, Sam Bird is due some bad luck, so probably won't be him. Um, but yeah, looking looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully the end of the season is a good one. Hopefully it will be, and if it is, well, even if it isn't, regardless of what happens at the end of the season, we will be here in. Did you say two weeks' time, Toby? Is it? Fortnite's time. We'll be here in a fortnight's time to summarise, discuss everything that happened in the Montreal e Prix or e Prix technically, because it's another doubleheader. So, yes, we will see you guys in two weeks' time where, well, 
will be crowning, or well, we won't be crowning specifically, but we'll be discussing the crowning of either Degrassi or Sebastian Bremi in this 2016 to 2017 Formula E Championship. <laughs> 